Greetings to those who are slowly coming out of their homes and still maintaining social distancing. Welcome to Grew with Portia, Poor and Told Edition. I'm your host, Portia Booker, and yes, this is my real name. Grew with Portia targets those who are curious, eager, and hungry for new information that can aid in their personal and professional development. Malcolm X once said, education is the passport to the future, for tomorrow belongs to those who prepare for it today. Never stop learning. Be a sponge for the rest of your life. Before I jump into my topic for today, I want to introduce my two guests who are joining me remotely. Welcome, Sonia Emerson and also Lauren Jones. Welcome, both of you. Thank you. Glad to be here. I'm glad to have both of you on, you know, kind of such a short notice with all the crazy things going on in the world today. So this episode of Grew Portia is a little bit different. We're currently in the middle of what I call a revolution. Changes are happening. And today we are shedding light on a topic that has been brought up many times, but only seems to get what I would call a Band-Aid solution. So let's dive in. So Sonia and Lauren, you know, we read a story that aired on our local ABC affiliate station, WWS, about kids found living inside of the Cuyahoga County office building. So when you guys read that story, what was kind of like your reaction to that? <sighs> Me, my reaction when I first read that story, I just instantly went into panic. I know how it is. I know how those kids feel because I've been down that road. I've, you know, felt that before. And like I said, I just went into instant panic. Yeah, I I definitely would agree with Lauren. I think that my first reaction was, oh my goodness, nothing has changed. And 10 years, 10 plus years removed from the child welfare system myself, I was utterly disgusted, to be honest with you, Portia. And instantly, actually, the person that brought it to my attention was Lauren. And Lauren, the first thing Lauren said was, we have to do something about this. We have to respond and we have to show up as young people and people have to know that we care about the lives of other young people. And so even in the middle of being so disheartened by the truth, we had to be honest enough with ourselves to say, what what's next? What happens next? And so it was just kind of like, there wasn't time to fall into this pity stage, but more of a reactionary stage of how how are we going to respond now? How are we going to deal with a sense of urgency? So um, totally, again, disgusted, sad, and honestly, and almost, it's almost kind of like vicarious trauma, right? It's like you you fill in something for them indirectly, but also because you have lived experience, it's almost re-traumatizing. And it's kind of, it's like a fresh wound all over again, like someone peeling that a scab and reopening that wound. And um, it didn't, it didn't feel good. It didn't feel good. Not at all. And coming from somebody who has not had lived experience myself, I was disgusted. I couldn't yeah. believe that they let these children stay in there for not just a week, but a month, yeah. a month. I mean, a month staying mm-hmm. in a building, a building. It's not like in the old days when buildings like apartments had names like the Magnolia Mm -hmm. or, Mm -hmm. you know, Mm -hmm. the Jefferson or whatever, where it actually had an establishment and you knew what it was. This is just a building downtown, an office. Yeah. And, you know, these kids are already kind of in that boat where they don't have a home Mm -hmm. or that Mm -hmm. sense of home wherever they were before they ended up down at this building. So I agree with you guys. I was a little shocked. Yeah. Yeah. And I'm like, So now that this has come about, what are they going to do? One of my key questions is, why do these type of issues continue to happen? (sighs) Me, myself, personally, I feel like it's a careless act. I also feel like it's just lack of... You know, I don't even know. I just feel like I just feel like it's a careless act. It's like they don't care. Yeah, and, and you know, another thing is, do you think not trying to play devil's advocate, but do you think that potentially with COVID and kind of the protests occurring, 
that that maybe had something to do with the delays in them getting these young people in some type of stability? No, no. This was going on way before COVID even existed. You know, like I said, this was going on when I was in foster care. This was going on when, you know, friends of mine were in foster care. This was going on when Sonya, you know, was in foster care. It, it has nothing to do with the pandemic that's going on. This has been going on for years. I mean, years. That's no excuse. And if they even threw that excuse at us, that would probably make me even more mad because, like, it's not, that's no excuse to me. Absolutely. And I agree. And I think, you know, with both you and Sonya coming on here and definitely telling you guys the stories and bringing this issue to the forefront because these young people are the future right i mean yeah yeah you know we're we're getting older um yeah we're gonna need somebody to one day stand up for if we ever have children exactly and, you know our yeah. children's children and so on no, I was just going to say, honestly, to to go along with what Lauren says, there's there absolutely is, isn't a justification of why it's happening. Now, I can say from both. So first of all, let me just say this. I have both lived experience and I am a professional in the work. Right. And so I know from a professional professional standpoint of view of partnering with Children and Family Services that there has definitely always been a capacity issue, whether that's with uh, capacity with staffing, you know, their agency, or there's a capacity issue with foster homes um, or their lack of. And so that is, a, that is a system issue, honestly. And when we talk about, when I say system issue, that isn't just happening in Cuyahoga County. That is happening all throughout the U.S. You read articles upon articles about, you know, just you know, turnover or the need for more foster homes. And so we can kind of get into that later in the conversation, but kind of going back to why these things are happening and if COVID is a contribution to why it keeps happening. So I would agree with Lauren and I would say ditto to the fact that this has been happening decades upon decades, but I would also say that COVID has given a lot of people the ability to kind of lean on that as a crutch to say, oh, things are shut down, so we slow down. The show does not stop because COVID is happening. If anything, we need to be more responsive and have more of a sense of urgency when it comes to our young people because they can easily fall through the cracks during this time. And so I know that they have tried to get creative as of ch as Children Family Services, and they're actually doing they're doing applications, uh, I believe on Facebook, I was hearing, interestingly enough, you know, because a lot of calls were down. It was uh, about, I believe, 50% 50, 50 of calls were cut. People were not calling in during COVID. And I think the assumption was because everything was kind of mandated to be shut down, a lot of people assumed that Children and Family Services were, were also slowed down. But that doesn't really address the issue when we talk about what is the, why is this continuing to happen with our young people that are sleeping in these buildings. I really believe, you know, they're, they're, they are still staffed, even during COVID. They're, you know, I do have uh, friends um, and peers that work um, as social workers, that work in capacity of leadership there at Cuyahoga Children Family Services. So there are people there. It's no excuse of why we aren't doing it. I understand that staffing can be an issue. And so, you know, not everyone can do, be all things at one time. So I do think that that's an issue, but a month is unacceptable. 24 hours is un unacceptable. And honestly, if you ask me, I don't think that kids should really walk into that building at all, quite frankly. I feel like the moment that we're responding to a call and going to someone's home to separate kids from their families, I believe we should have a plan. We should have another person on a different call and trying to immediately find access for that young person to have access to a bed that night. They should not really be entering into to that building. That's my belief. So Right, and to add to that, not only should they enter not only should they enter the building, but they shouldn't be able to exit that building without mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. an adult present or they shouldn't be able to freely walk away. Yeah. It, you know, it does be yeah. That's another yeah. issue. 
Yeah. And what Lauren's referring to is when you read the article, there was a young lady who also was obviously being housed there for a, a substantial amount of time. And this young lady just kind of walked out. And so I'm not sure if you um, had an opportunity, Portia, I know that you probably did read the article, but that's, that's a safety concern. So if we're bringing kids there and then there's no type of safety or protection around them just walking off of the premises, that is a safety concern for that young lady. Anything could have happened to her. And so you're talking about removing exactly. kids from so-called quote unquote unsafe homes. And then you're creating even more of a very hazardous situation, a very dangerous situation for our kids after supposedly pulling them away from those situations. Well, absolutely. And you touched on a lot. I mean, they leave one quote unquote home and then they go to someplace else. Yes. That's not even, it's like a, a limbo period. Exactly. Exactly. It's also, I also feel like they lack using the resources that are in Cuyahoga County or, you know, anywhere. There are a lot of resources. There are group homes in the Cuyahoga County area. <laughs> And I just feel like they didn't even reach out to these group homes. They, I just feel like they did not, they didn't try. Yeah. And honestly, that, that's a really good point, Lauren, about not trying. I think that, so I will, I will say, I don't think this matter of fact, when working um, in Cleveland and Cuyahoga counties, particularly, um, we knew on average that there were caseworkers or social workers were calling making three to five calls when a young person entered into their system came through intake they made three to five calls to family members so that's the issue in itself because as we know we you know Portia you have a lot of family whether uh, immediate or extended family you have family right, right. and that's the same story for these young people. They have families and we're not doing a well enough job and being diligent about reaching out to their family. I think that there's just kind of this definition uh, for children and family services of what family entails. But honestly, whether biological family of origin or chosen family, these kids have families. And so I really just feel like if it's a situation where you're saying, oh, we can't find a home for this kid, well, you need to be doing a better and more diligent job of reaching out to these kids' extended family. And in a lot of cases, these kids know who their family is, where they're at, and where they want to be. We need to do a better job of reaching out and accessing kinship. And so I, I just, there's no reason at all. Um, one of the things in the article, and I hate to get fired up and ahead of you here, but, you know, um, someone in leadership who spoke um, in the article or the, I should say, the news report with News Channel 5, the young lady said, oh, well, you know, this was the last resort. That made me sick. That should never be the last resort. And that when you talk about asking why is this still happening, that is also why, Portia, this is still happening. The mental models around this is the last resort. That's a mental model. And we really need to really like dismantle that mental model and say that this is unacceptable. By no means should this even be an option for them to be sleeping here in this, this building. So I won't go on because I know you probably have other questions and I really don't want to get ahead of myself here. But yeah, there's so much to say, <laughs> so much to say and so many problems that we have to address. Well, and no, no, Sonia, you're perfectly fine. I mean, this is, you know, for you guys to kind of like tell exactly how it is because yeah, that, that's yeah. the other problem. There's a lot of what I call lip service. Yep, and, absolutely. You know, and lip service has done nobody justice at yeah. all, except yeah. it protects the person who plays what we used to call in J school, human microphone stand. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. I love you know, that. I love that. It, it only protects them. It doesn't benefit Yes. The victims, it doesn't benefit Indeed. their families. It doesn't mm -hmm. benefit anybody else who has lived experience like both of you. Yeah, yeah. Well, and I, and I will say this. I think the butt of the bud, and, and this is kind of, if I could sum up why this issue is so important, and we kind of hit on it a little bit earlier. The point is no child should ever have to be removed from one traumatic situation to another. Just the removal alone of, and the re-entry or the entry into child welfare alone is traumatizing, right? But to take kids away from their living situations in a lot of cases due to neglect, which is the story data tells us, just to place them into another living arrangement, in this case, which we're talking about child, welf uh, child welfare building, 
where, where, it's just crazy. We are neglecting their basic needs, meeting their human basic needs. Um, and when I think of this, I really think of the Maslow hierarchy of needs. That's what came in mind when, when I first heard of the situation. And so when I talk about neglect, I really mean it just like that, neglect. You remove them from a neglectful situation, so-called, and then you neglect them as well. And so as many people are familiar with the hierarchy of needs, you know that in order, you need, you need to have a sense of belonging, you need to have human connection, you have psychological needs that needs to be met, you have the need to feel safety and security, all of those things are everything that they that is so unlawful and why they take children away from their families and then they go and create this kind of the same cycle right or this nexus of of, of the same issues and that's just so traumatizing to me and I, and i'm sure for these kids i can't even imagine um like i said i i did experience this in my own personal experience but a month that i can't even imagine i was going crazy after 16 hours sitting in that building um, and I, Lauren, I don't know if you can speak to that, but I'm just, it really breaks my heart. It really breaks my heart. The longest I've been in that building was a week. And they, you know, gave me many a placement, but I remember being in the place, you know, being in the placement for maybe a week or two, coming back. Then I'm there for another week, you know. Mm -hmm. They place you somewhere else, and then that placement doesn't work out, then you're back there. Wow. So it it's just, you know, it was it was back and forth for me. Mm. It was just, it was a back and forth thing. It was just, you know, and then, you know, I was young. I'm talking five, six, seven years old. I was young, so, wow. you know, it was, yeah, it was. I mean, that's, and, and like crazy. you said, Sonia, that is very traumatizing to a kid. It, it's almost like, and, and I'm, I'm going to say this out here and I may catch some heat from it, but it's almost like slavery. Oh, absolutely. It, it is a form of slavery. Absolutely. And like I said, no more yes. of the lip service, call it yep. what it is. Yes. You know, it's no, it's systemic. I, yes, absolutely. So, and when you say the word systemic, that's, that's exactly the message right now is that this isn't just, um, this isn't, first of all, this isn't an attack on Cuyahoga County Children's Family Services. This is the truth. This is the honest truth that this is a systematic issue. Mm -hmm. And when we talk about um, slavery and we talk about historical context, then we go back to orphan trains, right? That is what we know as today as foster care was orphan trains. They would go into these people's communities, separate these children from their family for so-called work, put them on trains, and then send them to a foreign place. And literally, they were orphans. They, a lot of, in a lot of cases, did not ever see their families again. And that was slavery. So when we talk about slavery, that was slavery. And so it, it definitely is some correlation between then and now, and not many things have changed when we look at it from a systemic point of view. And that is the disheartening truth of today's child welfare systems is that this is a perpetuated thing that we continue to see. It's just in a different way and we finesse it differently. And we, when we manipulate it to, make it to make it fit a different scenario, it's the same story, just different day. And it's sad exactly. because not only is it a different day, it's a different decade. Hell, it's a different century. And like, it keeps happening. And we, we, it has to stop. Yeah, I mean, it's just overall, it's just, it, it causes a bunch of confusion for, you know, children because they'll send you somewhere and you'll be calling somebody auntie or uncle or, you know, by all means, whatever they want you to call them, you know, because when you go to these different placements, you know, they may tell you different things. Like, it was times where I thought I was at my auntie's house. Mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. then uh, two or three weeks later, I'm leaving. I'm not staying with my auntie no more. I'm back in the building. And then, oh, you're going to your grandmother's house, you mm. know. Then come to find out, you know, as you get older and, you know, you become more, you, you become mature, then they break the news to you that wasn't your family. Mm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Wow. Mm. And and like you said, that's very traumatizing. And that to, to me 
Right, and that's why, to me, permanency is very important. Yes, absolutely. Because if I go and stay with somebody and, you know, they say they're my aunt or whoever it is, you know, that's somewhere where I want to stay. You know, I don't want to exactly. call this person my aunt for like a week or two and then next thing you know, I never see this person ever again. Mm, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Wow. That's, you know, I feel for both of you guys. I can't um, exactly relate totally because like I said, I have not had that type of experience. And, and I'm glad that I'm here talking to both of you where you can share your stories, you know, to help these young people get the system changed. I mean, cause like I said, we are in the middle of somewhat of a revolution right now. Yes, absolutely. You know, with, you know, with Black Lives Matter getting a lot of different things changed um, all over the world. So mm-hmm. I mm-hmm. commend both of you for coming on here. So let me ask both of you this. What changes would both of you like to see? You know, mm. whether it's, it's six months from now, maybe a year from now. Yeah. What yeah. changes would you like to see in this system? I would like to see that foster care workers to gain more knowledge, be more open to what these kids feel like they need. It's not always about what they feel is best for them. You know, I feel like there's a lot more counseling that needs to be done with, you know, with the children. They need to listen to how these children feel. And they need to work on more permanency. They need to work yes. on finding these kids places to stay permanently, you know. Maps to that, Instead yes. of pulling them out of these homes and sending them different places or, you know, taking them back to the building. And, I mean, it's just, you know, I would just like to see that. Yeah. Yeah, I I would definitely agree with Lauren. And and to your point, Lauren, the last point of us separating kids from their families. So I know that there are situations where we definitely have to get involved as a children family services as a system when we deem the situation not to be ideal or safe. But one of the questions someone always posed to me a few years back is, how do we get to decide what safety looks like you know how do we go into someone's home and say this isn't a safe situation what we know what the data shows is that 70 percent of the cases of why kids are removed from their homes is because of neglect neglect could mean several different things that can mean a single mother working two three jobs and she's trying to support her family and someone makes the call into children family services and they respond and they remove this kid from the home you know neglect could look like someone you know having having overtime or getting mandated at work and leaving their kid at the daycare center, you know? So how are we defining what neglect is? And instead of taking kids away from their families immediately, if it's unnecessary, which there's a lot of cases that are, it's just unnecessary. I had a case um, with a young person that was separated from their mom because she was smoking a lot of marijuana. Um, I, I, would, I was just stunned that you took a kid from this, se- this place and deem them to be unsafe because someone was smoking marijuana. Now, that's a whole political issue in itself, and I'm not going to get into that. But that right. should not and be. I also, I heard, I've heard cases more pettier than that. I've heard a case where there was a single mom. She had two children, and the only issue with her home was she was in low income housing, and not only was she in low income housing, but they had insects in the house. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. You know, yeah, something that, that yes. could have, that's yes. something that could have been worked around. Like, you yes, know, yes, absolutely. It, and she, you mm. know, the lady, she didn't deserve for her kids to be taken away from her mm-hmm. for something so small. Yes. You know, she had government support. You know, she got her food stamps and, mm. you know, the kids were fed, the kids were clothed, whether it, were, whether it was free clothes or, you know, whether she paid out of pocket. But yeah, yeah. They took her children because there were insects in the house. Yeah. And that wow. and then that goes back to the question of, you know, they're called children protective services. Who are we protecting these kids from? 
Because honestly, if I was to answer that in all honesty and my experience and young people's experience of who I work with and families I work with, we should be protecting our kids from you all as a system because you don't get to, you don't have the right to come in and rip apart families because of situations like Lauren just said. That should have been something that we could have resolved. There's enough funding for that. You know, there's, a, like she said, this, this mother was on government assistance. So why not help her get into a more suitable home mm -hmm. for her and her children? But so, so when, I'm, when I'm thinking about how do we change things, we really need to change, you know, our, 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 our collective biases as a system, one. Um, the way that we kind of target we target minority communities let's talk about that we target minority communities you're not and, and no offense you're not going to get a call from you know about sarah and rebecca's family i can guarantee you more than likely that they're going to try to find several different ways to figure out how that kid or those children can stay with their mother. When it comes to the African-American community, we are disproportionately represented in our child welfare system, especially in Cuyahoga County. And so that's really telling a bigger story. It's not that calls aren't coming in from Karen and Rebecca, it's that they're picking and choosing how they and who they serve and who they step up and help because it's the mental models and the collective biases the stories that we tell ourselves exactly. about what black families and single families mm -hmm. look like in our community vulnerable populations look like in our community so when i talk about the call like having a call to action some of the things that we can do is one create legislation that reflects you know how do we protect kids from spending x amount of time x amount of hours in a county building right so we start with legislation legislation. Then we go and address, okay, how do we, um, you know, allocate more funds towards, you know, creating spaces that are home spaces, not, not a building. A building is not a home. And I can't stress that right. enough. There is a, there is a way. And so someone actually asked me, I was on a call um, and someone asked me, well, what if we got beds in the building? I said, a building is not a home. If we get a bed in the building, we're still, we're still sending the message that these kids aren't worthy enough to have families, that these kids aren't worthy enough to sleep in a home and in a bed. There is a difference to have a building in a bed versus a, 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 a bed in a home. And because you're talking about connection, you're talking about human beings who thrive off of relationships, who thrive off of, you know, that, that their esteem is built because they feel connected to community. A building with social workers is is not community and I'm sorry to break the news to you you know like yeah, right. it's not so and, and another way is evaluating first of all what emergency permanency plan is set in place the first moment that there is a phone call to children family services we need to say what do we have a system or a model in which we follow like I said if you had one person driving to go and get the kid from the home and remove them then you need to have someone else doing another call saying oh we have a whole list already a list of foster parents and respite homes that said that they are willing to take emergency you know emergency house young people until they get into a more permanent housing situation at least it's a god darn home sorry excuse my language at least it's a home um, <laughs> You know, is it idea? No, we really, honestly, we don't want kids moving from place to place. That's traumatic in itself. But I can tell you, it's, it's way less traumatizing if they go to a home than a building that is cold and sterile and unwelcoming, and they don't see a reflection of anyone that looks like them in that building, unless it's a kid being pulled away or ripped away from their family. For me, with experience, and even with my brother, because me and my brother, we were, you know, together with this. We always felt like we were in trouble, like at all times. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. You know, we'll go to a home and then we'll end up, every time we end up back in that building, we feel like we're in trouble. Mm, what did I do? Like we What's did wrong something wrong. Like, yes. we, right. Like, what did I do? Mm -hmm. You know, it, it, it makes kids genuinely feel like they're in trouble, like mm -hmm. they did something mm -hmm. wrong. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Wow, that's deep. Yes. Wow. That does. It does. It messes with your psyche and, and it, it messes with the way that we show up in the world. And, and then they, you know, kids start to act out because they feel like, okay, well, you, you think that I'm bad or you think that I'm too difficult. So I have nothing to lose. So I'm just going to act out because no one cares about me anyway. And then, then it, it perpetuates the story of see, 
That's why families don't want this kid. That's why this kid can't get placed. They're too difficult. You know, they, they write in our files, you know, all types of stuff. But then at the same time, simultaneously, they're saying, well, we need more foster parents. Well, if you're telling foster parents that this kid is a tier four and they're the most difficult kid in the world, of course, foster parents are going to be hesitant to, to place that kid in their home. They're right. terrified. You know, it's a safety concern in a lot of cases. Some of these people have children in their home already, so they're already on guard. Like, what does that mean for my home, for my kids and my safety? So these kids are look, looked at as, as almost like people that are going to victimize when they're indeed the victims. They're the victims of a, of a system that has failed them constantly. They are victims of mental models that collectively we carry as a system. And when I say system, there are all types of systems, justice system, child welfare system. And a lot of cases, these kids have cross system involvement. And so if we continue to think like this, then kids are continue to be going to continue to behave the way that they behave because they feel like no one cares anyway. We need to do a better job. We, we need to challenge child welfare systems on how they're communicating to foster families who these kids are um we you know and i'm not even going to get into the tier, the rating things they rate kids i don't know if you know that portia but there's a there's a tier one tier two tier three tier, tier four in the child welfare system and all that tells us is if you're a tier one then you're like oh you're an angel you're probably fresh out of the womb for, born out of your mama's you know um you know lady parts and you, you know, people want babies, right? Everyone wants babies. You see when, when it comes to adoption, everyone wants babies. The older that you get, the more, the harder it is. So, so they say, I should say, the harder it is to find families because no one wants kids, um, you know, you know, a certain age and beyond. Usually teenagers or LGBTQ um, kids are really victims to, to a system that has failed us, that has perpetuated the stigma that if you're older, you know, uh, you're going to age out soon too. So you, you, you don't want a home and you don't deserve a home. That is not the truth. There, these kids have families. These kids have people that would love to take them in. It's the system that creates the story, their version of the story about this child that stops them from having homes. We need to, we need to do a better job of how they're communicating who these kids are. And it's, it's ridiculous. It's ridiculous. I agree. And, you know, you touched on one key thing when you talked about the kids and their mental health. Yes. Affected, oh, you absolutely. Know? And, you know, I'm very passionate about mental health. Very that much is a so. whole book. That is, that's, I don't even know if that, that's a know, whole, I mean, whew, that's, that's a whole, whole nother, yeah, yes. that's a whole nother episode for another absolutely. day. But, you know, and especially right now um, with everything going on, these kids already have a lot of mental health related issues that are not being addressed anyway, especially Absolutely. not in the African American community. Mm. So Sonia, yeah. you know, tell our listeners about your uh, event that you have coming up. Absolutely. So one of the things I do want to highlight is that this is a event that us as young leaders, myself and Lauren, um, actually, like I said, and Lauren it was the one actually who inspired me to move on this. And I'm so grateful for her as a leader in our community. So thank you, Lauren. Um, so this well, you're is, welcome. This, yeah, you're amazing. And this is, this is something that is oh, youth led, you. youth initiated. Um, and so we, we want to be clear about that because a lot of times when you see movements going on in the community, um, a lot of times we are not at the forefront of initiating those movements. Um, or sometimes we are and it gets lost in the translation of just the problems and the issues that we're facing that people forget that it's important to, to know who's organizing this. So I will say that first, that young people are organizing this. And so it's important that we show up for our young people to empower them, to encourage them that, that we're on the right path. And this isn't just for show. We don't want this to be something that's trending. This is something that is a real issue. Again, this has happened longer than it should have been happening. It will continue to happen if we don't get up in their faces. And I don't mean that in an aggressive way. And I want to be clear about this. The event that's coming up is a peaceful and silent demonstration. We purposely stayed away from the, the, the word protest. Um, even though we believe that there is a place for protest, um, we do not want to step on the toes of the Black Lives Matter movement. That is super important and revolutionary during this time. But we also want to know, we want to do a demonstration. And all that means is we want people to see us. 
you know, and it's not necessarily about us being loud. Um, you know, again, there is a place for that and an opportunity for that, but this is about being quiet and we're going to go to the Jane Edna Hunter building Tuesday from 3 p.m. to 5 p.m. And we're going to sit in front of the pillows peacefully and silently for those two hours. It will be hot. So I will say bring some water. We are requiring face masks. Um, but again, bring your pillow from your bed and your blanket and even a trash bag to tell the narrative that of the representation of all of the young people that are entering into foster care or that are changing homes into the, in the foster care system that have to sleep in these buildings over a night to days and months in a building that is not, is not a suitable place for any young person. It's, it's totally an inappropriate place for any young person to sleep even for an hour, if you ask me. It shouldn't happen. And so we are doing this, again, peaceful, silent demonstration as an example and as a call to action for people in leadership roles to care about our children. These are our children, emphasis on our, these are our children in our community, and we need to do a better job at caring about issues that surround our children and protecting our children. When we talk about protection and well-being and permanency, it starts with our community being educated and well-versed that that there is a whole, there are all types of subpopulations of young people that are worse off because we, we don't know what's going on with those kids. And it's not really our fault as a community. It's just that we really don't hear a lot about it until shit hits the fan. And I'm sorry to curse, but until things hit the fan, then all of a sudden we know. It. And, you know, I will say, even for myself, I had no clue that this was still happening. You know, I'm thinking it's been 10 plus years, they've got it together. Absolutely not. I was, I couldn't have been even more wrong. And I'm so sad. I'm so, I'm in so much pain to know that this is happening to our young people and that they're being told a story about their life is that, you know, that you're not deserving enough for a family. You're not deserving enough for a home. This kid that spent the one month there was 17 years old. And I can guarantee you this, in a lot of situations, and I know I was one of those kids that was dropped off to a shelter with a garbage bag and a good luck. These kids are, they're really waiting. This kid's 17, they probably said, oh, we'll just wait till this kid turns 18 and then we'll emancipate this kid out of care. You know what? What would have happened to this kid? And this is the honest truth. If, if the media hadn't caught heat to what was happening with this young kid, they would have aged out into homelessness because it sounds the way that they're painting the picture is that this kid didn't have any support. No one wanted to take this kid. So Portia, what do you think was going to happen to this kid? This kid was going to fall into homelessness and be another, another number and another person that the system failed. That is not fair to a 17 year old. That is not fair to a 14 year old. That is not even fair to a 20 something year old. We all deserve to feel a sense of belonging. We all deserve family. So I highly encourage people to be there. Me and Lauren will be there with our signs. You are allowed to bring signs, but again, we will be sitting on pillows um, around and in front of the Jane Edna building. We will not be going inside of the building as people who are demonstrating because we, again, we're trying to keep this on the legal side. We do not want any problems. We just want to really start the conversation um, around this. Um, there, we, we've done enough. They know they're very well aware. Our Children Family Services is well aware that this is an issue. But now it's time to call our community to like really call on our community to say it's beyond Children Family Services. It is a community issue. It is a public health crisis. And again, it's a public health crisis because. There are kids ending up falling into homelessness, falling into sex trafficking, falling into drug use, and you know, into the justice system because we are emancipating these kids out and telling the story that they, that there's no families or no homes available. That is not the truth. And we are going to change legislation one moving part at a time. And so this is just a little tiny thing, a call to action that we're doing. I also do encourage people in the community, whether you're a community member or you're an advocate or you're a teacher or your organization leader or executive director, please write letters to our city council people please write letters, I'll repeat that, to our city council, to our mayor's office, demanding that we have legislation that protects our kids from experiencing horrifying situations such as sleeping in a building. 
It is bigger than that, but that will just be the start. And we can start chipping away at making sure that we have true authentic system reform. And that's really it. That's really it. I hope to see you all Tuesday, three to five at the Jane and the Hunter building. It's on Euclid. I think it's 3955 Euclid Avenue. Please, I hope to see your faces there.